so about alolita she is a, a member of open telemetry governance committee so we will be hearing lot about observability today uh, personally i am really excited about this talk um yeah so let's get started over to you alolita hey hi everyone uh, thanks bhavan uh, thanks for a nice introduction hi everyone super happy to be joining in from california for this edition of pycon india 2021 uh, very excited to be part of the crowd is that as presenting at the conference uh, and uh, talking to all of you today about what's happening uh, about observability in the cloud um, again many of you already may be involved in the cloud native space and uh, so i'll just start a little bit about you know who i am for those of you i know a lot of uh, you know folks uh, who have joined and spoken and presented and participated at pycon india before but again super excited to be participating this year i'm a principal technologist at aws and i lead the open source observability strategy and engineering uh, for aws i also am a co-chair of the cncf uh, technical advisory group for observability uh, and of, of course, a member of the Open Telemetry Governance Committee. Um, I also, amongst many other hats I wear, am a board director at the Unicode Consortium, having done many years of language technology open source work, and also serve on the, have served on the boards of the Open Source Initiative, OSI, as well as SFLC India. Um, a little bit about my work. I've served uh, led engineering teams at Wikipedia, Twitter, PayPal, IBM, doing a lot of open source work over a long time. And uh, again, uh, please, you know, uh, follow me on Twitter or on Slack if you are, uh, you know, reaching out and chatting with me anytime. So with that said, uh, today I'm super excited to be talking with you about an area I've been deeply involved in for quite a while. Um, open source observability in the cloud. I uh, interestingly started my career as an engineer um, building monitoring software for real time networks. And early on, I recognized that the power, you know, that utility com computing built, brings to the table. Um, as you today know, utility computing is also called the cloud. And of course, I have been very passionate about the benefits open source brings to the table. So today I'm going to you know, deep dive into talking about what the cloud is, what observability, uh, you know, what cool things are happening in open source observability, and how do we leverage that. So what is the cloud, right? What does the cloud mean? We hear all about it um, in uh, different contexts. And um, to me, and, and the general definition really is, it is a distributed compute services you know, um, set of services. And, and, and the cloud today is multiple clouds, right? They're private public clouds as well as private clouds. And, um, you know, cloud computing is everywhere. It's the future of computing and it's happening right now. Um, the cloud is rapidly evolving into, you know, using more open standards and interoperability. And today I would say that the cloud is just, is just like electricity water and the internet it's a utility that everybody can use to spin up for computing and to be able to build and run services and applications so the cloud i think today and as you will see in through the course of this talk as well as you know as you've read and followed up on the cloud depends on open source um, it uses open source very heavily it also, uh, the cloud also, you know, leverages open standards to interoperate across multiple clouds, as I said, to seamlessly support um, not only on-prem uh, installations of components, but also public and private clouds. The open source also, you know, ensures that there is no vendor lock-in. And of course, it also helps accelerate innovation. Right. When you're building something in open source, you really get the best of breed in terms of engineering, engineering collaboration, and really a great solution. So today, uh, you know, every part of the cloud, and today's cloud especially, should be fully observable. And what does that mean, right? What, is, what does fully observable mean? 
means that every aspect of the cloud needs to be accessible. It, you, can, you should be able to observe every layer of uh, the cloud architecture, you know, and you should be able to um, observe every service and every component and every feature. It is that detailed and it needs to be uh, observable everywhere. So what does, what does that mean, right? If we look at the, uh, a typical uh, cloud architecture, it means that you have um, multiple layers in any, any typical you know, cloud uh, service architecture. You have the lower layers with hardware and uh, bare metal, uh, if you will, where you are looking at you know, getting metrics um, from CPUs, so like CPU utilization, memory utilization, disk utilization, and other kinds of you know, data to monitor your hardware. Right. Then you have your networking layer where you're looking at throughput, latency, bandwidth. You're looking at the infrastructure layer where you have different components like VMs or storage. Um, you know, we use tons and tons of storage for every one of our applications. Then you have frameworks like languages, right? Supposing you have written your application in Java or you've written it in JavaScript or in Go. Um, again, different language frameworks, you know, have built-in observability uh, components in them. And then you have databases where you are, you know, expecting data for monitoring and understanding, you know, how those databases are performing. And then last but not least, you have application in, in, in the entire, you know, on top of this whole architecture of layers, uh, where you have web apps or mobile apps that you're building and running or e-commerce apps and others, right? There are lots of different kinds of apps. So at the end of the day, as an end user, you're interacting with the application, but you really, as a cloud uh, you know, native uh, developer or a cloud native uh, provider, you are wanting to understand you know, what is happening in each of these layers. And, and, and there are two uh, very, very fundamental um, verticals that you understand and know about today, which is security, uh, as well as observability that need to support all of these layers in, in, in typical architecture, right? So again, you know, keeping that in mind, let's look at some of the observability projects that exist you know, in, the, in the ecosystem of you know, how do you actually look at different components uh, in the services and the applications and the components that we build. There are lots of observability projects, right? There are lots of choices for monitoring, for tracing, for logging, for metrics collection, for analysis of that data, for being able to visualize that data in the cloud. And as you can see in this diagram, you can see some of those choices are open source and some of them are proprietary, they're, they're products and uh, some of them are SaaS services. So the good news is that the industry in general and at large is increasingly getting behind open source solutions and open standards. So you see projects such as Prometheus or FluentD or Cortex or Jaeger or Open Telemetry or Thanos again, becoming very popular in large scale, uh, you know, companies who are using monitoring for their applications and services or any user of any cloud provider today, right? And, and in this whole wide set of projects, these are some very specific projects that are being, you know, gaining steam because of the compute that you use. For example, if you're using Kubernetes uh, based and building applications in that environment, you probably are using Prometheus. You're probably using Grafana, and and you know that that combination comes built in natively to be able to collect data and be able to uh, process it, analyze it, and then visualize it. So, what exactly is observability? Now, here you've seen so many projects coming about, looking at different aspects. You know, making features available to be able to collect all this data to be able to process it. So, fundamentally. Um, observability today means that you have an active, you know, understanding, an active pulse of the behavior of a system. 
and you can track the dynamic states of a system. So you have constant understanding of what is the pulse of the system, you know, through the data, the telemetry data that you're collecting, and also you are tracking the dynamic states. You also are taking into account through observability, the understanding of uncertainty and variation in that behavior so that you can see what kind of anomalies are you know, occurring in the regular functioning of a system. So the best solutions today in observability are actually live and open source. And what's new uh, you know, today uh, compared to old school monitoring is that observability, uh, you know, the capacity of computers and networks that we have used and we use prolifically has exponentially exploded, right? We have, we have the cloud. It's run on, you know, literally millions of computers and an entire huge, huge network, the internet included. And, and their scale and the diversity and compute power as well as commodity infrastructure uh, as well as fast speeds vastly increase the volume and complexity of telemetry data that we can collect, you know, for of to for observability and the, the you know amount of data that we can collect from the different layers of the cloud services as well as the applications that run on top to be able to empower advanced data analysis, you know, using machine learning, for example, to understand patterns at scale as well as visualize them. So a very interesting quote, you know, which is quite popular in the observability space is that monitoring tells you about whether the system works. Observability tells you why it's not working, right? That is, you know, it's again, understanding the behavior of how systems work at scale and how they work in the cloud. So today's observability um, you know, definition really has three major signals. Many of you have, who have worked you know, in, monitoring, in the monitoring space for a long time uh, may already know this, where there is you know, three signals, tracing, uh, where you, know, you can see tracing, you know, traces track a very discrete transaction through its life cycle in the system. And the request for you know, a span of traces is very scoped based on the request that is made. Uh, metrics, for example, measure an attribute of the component you know, at a very particular point in time. So it's a data point you know, at a point in time for the system. And then metrics, uh, and along with metrics logs, which most of us are very familiar with, you know, writing applications, debugging, uh, logs, you know, and logging record, uh, records are part of recording information about discrete events, right? So across those three types of data, there is petabytes and petabytes of data that's collected from all these millions of devices whether the, and, and services and applications that are either sitting in the cloud or on, you know, using the clouds or, or being able to talk to the cloud, you know, through edge devices, right? And uh, events are emitted, you know, from enormous number of devices, as you know, and those are logged. Uh, metrics, which are point in time data are aggregated and aggregatable, if you will. And tracing, of course, as I said earlier, is very much, you know, the transaction and tracing that life cycle of the transaction as it, as it uh, you know, runs from start to end. So why does observability matter? Why is it essential to the cloud? It's because um, we want to be able to achieve the following capabilities. Um, we want to be able to diagnose um, you know, problems on, uh, in the cloud. We need to be able to have prognosis capabilities to predict behavior, to understand the health of systems at any given point in time and across and over time. Uh, we also want to establish a basis for self-healing and self-provisioning of systems, which is uh, super important in order to form a snapshot of you know, what exactly is happening in these complex layers, right? And then these complex interactions across multiple layers, across multiple services. And last but not least, future-proofing uh, using techniques such as machine learning, for the smart adaptation of systems, right? So we are constantly trying to learn how the systems can actually self-heal, can self-provision, or at least you know, provide patterns where you can actually correct and auto-correct 
um, and provision uh, systems as needed. And that's a big deal because it really, you know, makes sure that you're optimizing your resources for your services as well as your applications. So what do we get out of that, right? We want to achieve all these capabilities using observability. And, and then what that does is for the end user, uh, it really, really provides the ability to maximize uptime. That is your application doesn't go down. It's always available. You know, that's the... Uh, that's the idea of having utility computing that you have, you know, uh, you can spin up a cluster whenever you need to and spin down and once you're done. But you can also have it running all the time as we do for production systems. Similarly, you know, strengthening security, uh, which is very key for large scale systems, especially in the, uh, you know, large enterprises ensuring reliability and also ensuring scalability of systems is super, super important. So that said, again, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about observability patterns, right? And, and why this matters. As many of you know, who have been in the industry for a while, even in the last decade, we have moved from building monoliths to microservices. The cloud today, consists of not only multiple clouds, but it also consists of thousands of microservices. And what that means is that, you know, there are services for each kind of function. Monoliths just don't work because they are fragile and they're expensive. And they are very expensive to maintain for an end user who is interested in having scalability, reliability, availability across the world for their services and the applications that they're building. So microservices, you know, today, which are really modern architecture now, um, enable commodity scaling, as well as diverse interoperability, which is super important for, you know, again, being able to provide the benefits that we talked about before of uptime, of security everywhere, of ensuring reliability, ensuring scalability. And that's something you want to keep in mind as you're designing microservices, as you're designing your applications and how do you optimize for using those services the best. So I will talk a little bit about, you know, what do observability pipelines mean now, right? Observability pipelines, you'll hear about it if you're working with any of the cloud providers or any kind of, you know, cloud architecture, you also understand the concept of pipelines. And in the observability um, environment, and observability architecture is typically composed of at least three stages. And that means that you are discovering data sources and collecting data. Then you are processing and analyzing that data. And then you want to visualize those patterns so that you understand the behavior of your system. So open telemetry is a very interesting project. You know, it's a big, very large open source project, second only to Kubernetes in terms of the number of contributors to the project, as well as the implementation that is extremely popular in the industry. Uh, open telemetry it provides, you know, an open source collection agent uh, that's called the collector, as you can see in the middle of the diagram, as well as libraries with APIs and SDKs to be able to instrument your applications to send telemetry data, as well as a data protocol that is based on open standards called the Open Telemetry Protocol to be able to unify the uh, monitoring, managing, and debugging of applications and services, right? So again, it's very, very much a, you know, a um, method and, and a project that is very popular to use as a collection agent to instrument your applications, to collect data from your applications, whether that's traces or logs or metrics, and also be able to collect, met, you know, data from your services to understand the behavior of the full stack. Interestingly, Open Telemetry also actually supports all the three data signals, as I just said, in 11 languages, which means, you know, if you're using Java or if you're using JavaScript or Go or Python um, or, you know, .NET, it is all available and you can just use one of the SDKs uh, and, and APIs and just run with it. So again, take a look at it. It's, it's uh, opentelemetry.io, but this is, you know, the first part in a pipeline, right, collection. The next part is actually 
how do you manage and control, right? Which is part, the core part of monitoring. And many of you who are working in the Kubernetes space, especially should have heard about this, where um, Prometheus, um, you know, which, which is very heavily used in the Kubernetes world, especially is an open source systems monitoring and alerting framework, right? It's a toolkit uh, and that has grown in popularity over, you know, the last few years. And it's a very powerful way of actually instrumenting your Kubernetes applications and orchestration, being able to discover, you know, uh, services that to collect data, telemetry data. So service discovery is a very important part of that process. And then being able to actually push that uh, and the Prometheus core server, of course, you know, acts as a data store where it collects the metrics, you know, receives the metrics and then is able to store them as time series data. And then also at the same time, along with that time series snapshot, you have key value pairs that are labeling the kind of, you know, the kind of data that which node is it coming from, which cluster is it coming from, you know, and that kind of meta information that is also sharing. Um, Prometheus also comes with an alert manager which actually gives you the ability to trigger alerts based on you know the type of data and the thresholds you're setting for different types of rules uh, based on you know what you're observing right so if you're using an alert manager in prometheus you should be able to send that set an alert and then send notifications to different you know sources if you're managing in uh, production uh, network, you should be able to send it through email or through your pager or anything else. So it's very interesting because Prometheus, you know, kind of is a great example of an open source system, which is very high quality, robust, and, you know, just as open telemetry is. And to be able to manage and uh, to manage your data as well as manage your observability and control it, right? So let's move on to the third part of the visualization, which is um, you typically once you have the data collected, once you've been, you know, collecting it over time, you want to know more about it. And, you know, Prometheus helps you uh, analyze that data, helps you, you know, trigger alerts on it, helps you process that data and store it. So what do we do with all that data? And, and fundamentally, uh, what you do is you visualize it. You want to look at, you know, your dashboards, but you want to also be able to completely configure them. You, have, you want them to be uh, auto-configurable. And, and to be able to show the behavior of all your systems at any given particular point in time. And Grafana is another open source exam uh, project, which is you know, extremely popular for visualization. And it's a visualization framework that allows you to query the data that is stored in Prometheus as a data store, visualize that data, and also you know, be able to use the alert manager out of Prometheus uh, to be able to observe your metrics and alert and notify, right? So uh, one of the great, um, you know, ways of uh, really looking at this data is through a single pane of glass. You don't want to have, you know, in the old days of monitoring, you used to have uh, 10 monitors all around you looking at different kinds of da dashboards. Now, you know, what we can do with observability components in open source is that something like Grafana can actually pull all your dashboards together and be able to, you know, clearly show only what you need, right? You don't have to see five or to 10 screens in order to go and find the information you're looking at. You can configure it and see everything in a single pane of glass. Similarly, uh, it, there's also tremendous flexibility to be able to ingest data, uh, you know, to any backend or to any database. Um, and of course, as I said earlier, alerting is done through Prometheus and Alert Manager. So here you're looking at, you know, all the three parts of the basic pipeline, which is collection, you know, discovery, collection, um, processing and analysis and storage. And then the third part being visualization, right? So all this with open source, right? These are open source projects that are used by, by literally, you know, a lot of the enterprise companies for being able to observe their systems. So one of the things I'd like to do here is do a call out to how Python is used, right? And I, I'm taking an example of Python in, in open telemetry. 
because um, you know Python is a very popular language, and in fact, you know, as many of you know, uh, it's one of the most popular languages. In fact, it's the second most popular language in you know the language uh, analysis and and research that is done every year by Redmond. Uh, Python was uh, you know again measured to be the second most popular language in the ecosystem in terms of usage. And there are many ways that Python is used today not only in DevOps, not only you know, for observability, uh, but also for machine learning and other applications, as you know. So going back to Python in open telemetry, um, again, as I was mentioning to you earlier, there are 11 languages that open telemetry supports. Um, and Python is one of the very popular ones. So in open telemetry, if you go to, you know, again, all the code is on GitHub. Um, if you go to open telemetry and go to the github repo for open telemetry python you'll see that you know there is a set of uh, stable apis and sdks uh, that actually enable you to um, collect traces and be from your application so you can if you have a python application you can actually instrument um, you know the the application using uh, the python, open telemetry sdk and api and then just be able to send it, uh, you know, using the collector, which is the uh, the uh, collector has an exporter component, which enables you to export it to any kind of, you know, backend um, observability platform that you want to, right? So you could be using Prometheus, you could be using um, some other, you know, uh, proprietary system, or you could be using, you know, any other monitoring platform that where you can ingest a very particular format. Um, but remember, on the you know on the wire within Open Telemetry, the Open Telemetry data protocol is used OTLP. So that said, again, I'd love for you guys to you know and and all of you to go and check out uh, the Python Open Telemetry API package as well as the Python uh, Open Telemetry SDK package, which are both downloadable from PyPy. And uh, you know, go and instrument your applications. Try it out. You know, you can ingest traces. You can also have. There is also uh, development work going on for metrics, and of course, also for logs. Um, right now, tracing is stable. The project is, you know, a great place to actually uh, contribute. It's a very welcoming project, and um, you can, you know, help build out some of the functionality for metrics as well as for logging. And um, you know, go check it out. I shared a snapshot here. You know, there again, as you can see, exporters, the API, SDK, and and also another thing I'd like to call out is that the Open Telemetry project is very interesting because it actually also has an open standard, as I'd mentioned to you, and it also has a specification, which means that it has an observability collection mechanism. You know, which is actually a specification as a technical standard would. And you, sh you can actually go through that, take that as a reference, and then implement it in any language you want. So you know, out of the 11 languages that exist right now, if you see that there is another language that you'd like to build out the API and SDK in, all you need to do is, you know, hey, file an uh, issue on the project, say I'm interested in this language, it's not supported yet, and you know, create a community of your own and build it out. It is an open specification, and that's the great advantage that you can take that implementation and be able to just run with it. So that said, again, uh, just you know, super, uh, uh, just welcome you to come and um, participate. You know, it's a very great way of actually leveraging open source to really build some innovative observability components, as well as actually, um, you know. Uh, be associated as a maintainer, which is always a great thing in open source, right? So um, last but not least, I'd like to actually um, call out on, you know, how to get involved in these large projects because, you know, open source observability projects, many of them are very large. They have literally uh, hundreds of contributors, you know, Kubernetes, as you know, is a great example. The multiple SIGs there, who discuss different kinds of topics, different areas of topics, you know, uh, for example, and open telemetry is also very much similar. Uh, where you have SIG meetings, you know, where um, different contributors, you know, are coming up with discussions and questions can come up and talk uh, to each other. They can talk to the maintainers, discuss that, 
these are all virtual and online. So anybody can join in from anywhere across the planet. And, um, you know, they are held both on um, uh, U.S. time as well as, uh, which is also friendly to Europe, and then also on APAC time, which is friendly to India. And, and uh, again, super easy to participate in. Um, and I'd welcome you to, you know, come and join some of these SIG meetings. They are recorded, you know, and they are held very regularly. The meeting notes are all public and, you know, documented very heavily. Um, very transparent projects. You have mailing lists also that you can follow if you're not, you know, if you cannot make it to the SIG meetings. Uh, and of course, all the code is on GitHub. So you should be able to, you know, go and file an issue or, you know, go and follow up on a particular problem you're having and just go and look it up. Um, also, as I was saying uh, earlier, uh, nowadays, you know, it's very flexible. So every project, every open source project especially can go and have their own YouTube channel. So most of the projects today in open source, you know, record their SIG meetings or their discussion meetings that they're having and make it available so that, you know, any contributor who's looking at a particular um, section or interested in a particular question can come and look at it again later, right? And then last but not least, of course, there are chat channels, you know, just as we at PyCon today have chat channels, it's similar to that, you know, every project, uh, whether that's at CNCF, ASF, or other projects, you know, all have some form of chat channels, whether that's Slack or others. And, and in this particular case, you know, uh, both open telemetry as well as Kubernetes uh, have Slack channels, you can just join them uh, and just participate. Um, again, I would really, you know, welcome all of you to join in and, uh, you know, participate on these projects. It, observability is a huge area and very, very uh, compelling area. There's lots of solutions to be built. And there are lots of, you know, there's a lot of work that is happening in terms of instrumenting applications as well as compute uh, services, as well as um, uh, other different types of uh, applications well, right? So again, please take a look and, you know, if you have any questions and I can help you, I'm always available, you know, ping me on Slack. Uh, you should be able to get hold of me on the CNCF Slack. So uh, that's it. I really, really appreciate, you know, joining in today and, uh, you know, again, sharing some of my experience and, uh, and uh, really hope that, you know, all of you enjoy PyCon uh, for the next couple of days uh, over the, uh, you know, 35 plus talks that are ongoing at the conference. I know we live in a virtual world today, right? and it's so cool because I can join in from California and be able to present and you know talk with you. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have at this point. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and I really look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully next year. Thanks. Awesome. That was great. So yeah, people, if you have any questions, go on the Q&A tab and add your question there. Um, we have a couple, so I will start with them. All right. So the first question goes, I use Prometheus and Grafana, uh, but my data collection mechanism is via node exporter. Is open telemetry something similar to node exporter, like computes, collects, and passes the data to Prometheus, or is yep, it different? Yep. It is, it is. It's very similar. And, and you have the uh, JS uh, API and SDK that you can use uh, where you can just, you know, instrument that it, it goes and does the service discovery, it goes and does the collection for you, uh, and then can pass the data to and Prometheus server on the back end through the uh, Prometheus uh, exporters that are in open telemetry, for sure. And then you can, of course, visualize that data from Prometheus into Grafana. So you can, you know, interchangeably totally use that. Awesome. Let me get to the next one while we are waiting. So the question is, uh, what is better? Uh, use Prometheus DB as data source for Grafana or Influx DB as data source for Grafana? Actually, it depends. If you are, uh, you know, the fundamental difference really is that so InfluxDB, for example, uh, just like Cortex or Thanos, it uses a remote write 
uh, you know, uh, way of actually sending data, pushing data to the uh, endpoint. Uh, and Prometheus DB, on the other hand, does a pull, right? So you, by default. So you want to be able to, you know, again, it depends on your use case. Obviously, Influx DB or Thanos or, you know, Cortex are used for scalable, scalable solutions where you're pushing data from a customer application into, uh, you know, a server for monitoring and observing uh, data. So it really depends on your use case. Uh, the feature set is the same. But it really is, you know, what is your use case? Are you pushing data or are you pulling data? Awesome. There are a couple of questions flowing through now. So let's get to them one by one. Totally, totally. Ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great way to actually share information and share and learn from each other. So what do you use for searching and storing through logs? Well, uh, uh, typically, uh, searching in for logs in as an open you know solution has been done with Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is a very uh, you know popular way of actually searching through uh, log information. But there are several other tools uh, today which are you know which you should track and and uh, use. Uh, Loki is one of them. Uh, and, and, you know, again, there are other tools also. There's logging um, being built, logging collection being built in open telemetry. But then again, for storing, uh, you would probably end up using something like Elasticsearch or, or you know, Loki. Loki and and, and uh, uh, you would actually, um, if you were using a proprietary solution, you know, you could even use Logs.io or one of the other products. Right, but I mean, here we are looking at open source very specifically. You know, again, and we direct. I recommend using an open source solution. Okay, next one. Can you please give a brief higher level overview of Grafana? I think um, I I went over a, a high level overview, so you probably can catch up you know, on, on my slides, um, you know, again, Grafana is a visualization, open source visualization framework. And uh, it enables you to, you know, again, create dashboards, uh, manage them in a single pane of, you know, single window, single, as it is called a single pane of glass, and, and also be able to actually generate alerts, which, you know, push data then to these dashboards real time, and you're able to visualize them, right? You can also actually query data in Grafana and be able to set rules and thresholds to be able to visualize that. So um, fundamentally, it's a very sophisticated uh, visualization uh, framework, and it's open source. It's used a lot with Prometheus, Lockstep, but it's also used with you know, open telemetry uh, and other you know, uh, frameworks. And you can actually go to GitHub uh, dot com slash Grafana to go and learn more. It's all open source. Uh, you know, there's some excellent documentation. Uh, please, please take a look at it. Next one. How do you determine the cost benefit analysis of having to store tons of metrics long term versus storage costs? That's a complex uh, question because it really depends on a lot of factors and um, again, cost benefit, you know, analysis really comes from uh, factoring in a lot of the different, um, you know, components like the number of services you're using, uh, the type of, you know, pricing mechanisms that different services have. If you're operating on a single, uh, you know, cloud versus a multi, multi hybrid cloud environment, you know, how are your uh, environments uh, and your computes configured? Um, there's a lot of different factors that actually, uh, you know, you have to consider when you're doing a cost benefit analysis. And uh, storage costs is not the only factor uh, that, you know, influences that. Obviously, there are lots of other factors, especially, you know, when you're pumping in uh, terabytes and petabytes of data from you know, real-time systems that you're monitoring or you know, real-time services or applications you have. So again, I, you know, again, there is a lot of um, uh, 
you know, there are a lot of cost benefit models that are available uh, for different providers. Also, the factors, you know, as to how you can uh, use, um, you know, a matrix of considerations and factors. So, again, I would say it's not, there's no one uh, answer to this. <laughs> there really is. It's, it's a complex matrix. But happy to send you, you know, if you ping me on Slack, I can definitely share some links with you. Definitely. Um, there are a lot of questions, so I'll be filtering out a few. Okay. Uh, Alolita will be available, and we still have time. So I will pick up the ones which are uh, most voted or something, and then we'll go from there. Awesome. Yep. Yeah, there is one related to open telemetry, which sounds interesting. Can open telemetry be used to intercept requests to database and write to a file? Uh, if not, any suggestions in such scenarios? Yeah, open telemetry can be used to actually um, uh, discover uh, data sources and then be able to send that to a file or any other you know, backend monitoring service that you're using. Um, there is a file exporter in open telemetry in the collector, so you can take a look at that. Um, and there's also, you know, you can you can uh, also use a new component that is landing into uh, Open Telemetry for database uh, queries and database data metrics being picked up, which is SQL Commentator, uh, you know, donated by Google uh, to Open Telemetry. They are also actively working on the project, but you know, all of us, there are a lot of con main contributors who are getting involved. And uh, that's a great component to actually use and, and be able to use for database uh, data metrics that are getting ingested for observability. So yes, absolutely, you can do that. But I, I, just to be clear, you know, you can query with SQL Commentator also. Uh, again, if you're also interested in working on the project, you're welcome to join in. This is going to be slightly interesting. Are there any new innovations in the observability space or all or the projects are mostly identical? This is going to be interesting. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is a good question. Uh, I think that uh, uh, by no means uh, are all projects identical. Different projects, as I was highlighting earlier, you know, in the list of projects that I was showing you and sharing with you, um, there are lots of different types of projects because open source, you know, enables uh, and and really, really um, uh, enables everyone to be able to contribute and and their ideas. And if you have a cool idea, you know, about implementing a particular type of query or optimizing query languages, you know, to get and collect data or innovate on service discovery algorithms or add machine learning or add sampling. Again, there are so many applications in the observability space that it's not just you know collection and processing and, and export and, and visualization, right? There's a lot you can do in that pipeline. And uh, you know, obviously in the hundreds of projects that exist today in open source for observability, there are some which are very popular because they do provide end-to-end -end solutions. But on the other hand, there are also very specific projects that actually support uh, specific functionality that you can plug in into a larger project. Like Jaeger has a whole bunch of plugins, or Zipkin has a whole bunch of plugins, or you know, Open Telemetry has plugins. So you can plug in, uh, you know, what you need, and and build that out. So again, just answering the second part of your question, all projects obviously are not identical. The first part. Uh, in terms of new innovations in the observability space. As I was uh, mentioning earlier, uh, there's a lot of innovation because, uh, as you know, uh, you know, our entire uh, method of computing and at scale has changed. We have, you know, uh, today we live in a generation of computing where there are literally, you know, trillions of computers sitting on the network and being able to, you know, uh, share data, uh, operate as um, clusters and being able to actually um, 
you know, build and scale out huge applications, you know, which are available across the world um, as, as services, right? So um, the innovation that is happening in that space is really related to these areas. How do you actually scale large scale systems? You know, it's a, it's a, we're at a generation we've never been at where scalability is, you know, at, at a absolutely a new uh, level in terms of the number of machines working with each other, right? We used to talk about high performance computing. Today, high performance computing is utility computing, right? So similarly, um, how do you make systems reliable? You know, there is a whole whole uh, area of work which is happening. You know, how do you make systems self-aware, self-provisionable, and self-healing, right? I mean, how do systems understand that they need to adjust their behavior if they're going out of threshold? Do they need to add another node? Do they Can they go and add a cluster themselves without you having to go and manually provision it yourself, right? So on these large scale networks and these large scale you know, systems, the cloud needs to be very self-aware of itself. And, and that's the goal we are driving to it. So in, this, in the scale of things, reliability, security, uh, scalability, as well as feature sets that actually support these and performance um, are, are areas that, where observability is key, right? If you don't understand the behavior of a system, how do you actually go and enable it to be self-aware? And observability is all about that. So needless to say, there's enormous amount of innovation going on in the observability space and all in open source. Slightly related question. So uh, which features are you excited about in the open telemetry roadmap? I think, uh, uh, you know, I mean, we just uh, are on the cusp of actually going 1.0 for all of tracing right now. And so that's super exciting because we are, you know, at this point in open telemetry, uh, tracing is stable. And um, now we are all working on metrics. And that's something which is really exciting because metrics, you know, has very diverse space. Uh, one of the areas that I have been working on personally, which I'm super excited about is interoperability, ensuring that the open telemetry protocol, data protocol is actually compatible with the Prometheus protocol and being able to actually transmit, you know, data back and forth interchangeably across, you know, open telemetry as a collector and then pushing it to, you know, Prometheus for analysis, right? So um, I think that that's an area I'm super excited about because I do think that, you know, interoperability is always key uh, when you have different open source projects or open source components, you still need to have a common protocol because at the end of the day, the end user benefits and you avoid lock-in if you if you have a common protocol, right, which is an open protocol. So I think that's something that is, I am super excited about. And then, of course, logging is coming up. Uh, you know, logging is also in beta right now, and uh, it should be stable. Both metrics and logging will be stable um, by the you know by Q1 next uh, just in 2022. So metrics metrics will go stable first um, Q4, and then we are targeting to have logs stable. So again, lots of functionality uh, coming up. Is there any community agreed standard for observability, like CNI, CRI, OCI in they, Kubernetes? Um, they, um, it's a good question because I mean, you know, that's one of the huge benefits that uh, the Open Telemetry specification has had. It is actually a common agreed standard by the industry, uh, which is the Open Telemetry protocol, and that's something that is used interoperably. So you as, uh, just like in Kubernetes, uh, you know, there are common standards that are forming in, uh, in um, observability also, and you'll see an uh, adoption of a tremendous amount of, you know, and, and a tremendous amount of consolidation, if you will, towards open standards uh, as observability you know, in, uh, projects, you, you know, become larger and, and evolve. Um, one of the things that is happening, as I said, OTLP definitely is a common standard. Um, another, you know, protocol that is being uh, worked on right now is the EBPF, uh, low-level protocols. So again, 
uh, at the kernel level, you know, how you collect um, metrics, how do you collect data there, and what's the common protocol there. Uh, similarly, Prometheus protocol has existed, and that's a common, you know, protocol. Uh, and then uh, you also have, you know, other W3C uh, specifications, such as the distributed tracing specification, which is also another observability uh, standard for tracing. So yes, uh, you know, they're definitely standards that are evolving and, and they are interoperable. Okay, there are a few questions which have got a lot of upward, so I'm selecting those. Uh, how is Grafana different or similar to Kibana? Uh, or is that even the case? At what point would a user want to switch to Grafana when there are already ELK capabilities available? Well, I think, um, again, it depends on your use case. Uh, just historically, you know, Grafana actually was a mm, fork of Kibana originally. Right. And, and uh, again, it, it, came, it evolved from, you know, that uh, uh, space. But needless to say, Grafana actually has a completely different architecture today and has been, you know, uh, natively uh, built out to uh, it's a React based, you know, uh, framework. Um, and and uh, whereas uh, Kibana actually, you know, was an Angular earlier and they've been migrating it. But uh, the point being that, um, yes, it is. Uh, it came from the same origins, but it's completely different today in terms of feature sets and just the ability to consume more data sources and to be able to uh, consume different types of, uh, you know, and, and to be able to uh, process different types of data, right? So again, you can apply for a lot of complex visualization, you know, patterns and rules uh, in Grafana. And uh, again, the evolution trees are always different. Uh, you know, no project is the same as the other. And, uh, you know, again, Grafana has been very heavily used in the Kubernetes space. Uh, Kibana has been more traditionally tied, and especially with the license that it has now, uh, it's very much um, tied to Elastic Search. It's not really used in any other use case, whereas Grafana is far more ubiquitous and used used in a lot more data data sources and a lot more types of pipelines. Uh, your thoughts on pulling metrics versus pushing them, and when does pull works better than push? Well, um, push is very popular for services. Okay, and and. Uh, Again, push uh, you know capabilities are usually used when you have uh, customers you know or users who have um, you know large enterprises, especially who have their own uh, security protocols, right? So when they don't necessarily want an external server like a Prometheus server to go and come and pull their metrics, they want uh, their their uh, they want to be able to push their data to a you know monitoring network right on a monitoring service. So uh, typically push metrics, you know, pushing metrics is used a lot, uh, especially in open telemetry, you know, the Prometheus remote write exporter um, that, uh, you know, uh, actually my team contributed to the project uh, was um, built uh, and is very popular for, um, you know, groups and users who are using, um, the uh, secure, you know, secure environments, uh, whether those are banks or whether those are um, other, you know, uh, institutions who have, you know, compliance um, that they need to follow. And in that uh, case, typically, you will use push protocols, you will not use pull. Pull is more that if you're running self managed, for example, and this is again points back to the origins of. Uh, Pull, you know, being typically very easy to do for a self-managed setup. If you have a small setup that you're running, you know, for your startup or for, you know, 10 engineers in your company who are building an application, self-managed, you know, using pull servers is probably very easy and very easy to, you know, um, set up. But push metrics, I really push is used for really heavy grade service, um, you know, 
when you're sending in petabytes of data and you don't want to think about it, right? You're just completely pushing data as a stream. Yes, probably the last question now. All right. Cool. Uh, what's your take on AWS CloudWatch logs and metric services compared to other tools uh, as the observability tools we discussed? I think yeah, it depends on the generation of applications you have. If you're if you're in you know building, for example, if you're building Kubernetes-based uh, applications or you know using Kubernetes-based services, the chances of you using an open source you know solution or a pipeline is very high for observability. Um, you can also use you know something like the managed service for Prometheus, which you know AWS also rolled out, but uh, again, uh, you know, it really depends on your use case. And, uh, uh, you know, if you've already instrumented with CloudWatch, you can use CloudWatch. If you're use in, you know, using some other uh, pipeline, like Kubernetes-based uh, applications or other, uh, you know, uh, applications, you, 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 you have a lot of different choices. And, and again, use the best solution that works for your use case. So there's no one perfect answer here. <laughs>